welcome you. We just are a couple minutes away. If you're tuning in now to Wednesday Night Live, we're going to start in just a couple of minutes. Good evening. I'm Cal Lord, and I want to welcome you to our Wednesday Night Live service here, 6.30 p.m. at Central Baptist Church. And if you're just joining us, uh, again, we have a very simple format, but I wanted to share a couple of, of uh, announcements. On Sunday, we have two services planned. We have a service planned for the sanctuary at 9.30 a.m. Notice that that's a new time, 9.30 a.m. We move to our summer hours. And uh, you need to call the church either tonight and call right now, 596-4929. That's area code 401, 596-4929. Or you can respond to one of my emails and just say, hey, put me down, save a space at the table. That's Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. in the sanctuary. And then we're gonna have a parking lot service at 11 a.m. You can come sit in your car. The nice thing about that is that you won't have to wear your mask as long as you're in your car. We're not gonna take your temperature. You don't have to wash your hands. Well, actually, wash your hands anyway. Uh, but uh, come and sit in your car. The ushers will help find a spot. You can wave to people, but we ask you to stay in your car, and roll the windows down and enjoy the service. Uh, there is a, a bathroom available. You'll be able to use that uh, in the event of an emergency, but then you might have to have your temperature checked. So. Um, but anyway, that's Sunday, 9.30 in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock in the parking lot. Call and make a reservation for one or the other, just so we know about how many people are coming. Also, we want to share with you the, the fact that our church library is open, the church prayer chapel is open, so uh, most mornings you can call, make a, an appointment, and come on in and just uh, check out one of the great resources we have in the library, one of the great books or movies, or come and just spend a little time in prayer in the chapel. Also, if you'd like to come in and pray with me, uh, I'd welcome you, just set up an appointment, uh, call Dorothy and uh, we're doing that, or if you wanna do a Zoom appointment, we can also arrange that. So that's a few of our announcements for today. Tonight, we are going to, uh, we're going to start off with a call to worship. I've got a few of our members of our prayer team here, and they're going to join me. And then we're going to sing In the Garden. We're going to sing the first and second verses of In the Garden. So here we go. Archbishop William Temple said, Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by His holiness, the nourishment of mind with His truth the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable. Let us worship the Lord. We hope to have some more of the technology back next week with, uh, with uh, maybe one of Scott's songs and uh, a call to worship that you could read along with. Uh, but again, as we're doing this transition, uh, we're doing baby steps here as we do the big steps on Sunday morning. So we're going to sing In the Garden, the first two verses. Many of you probably know the first verse. If you don't know the second verse, come along at home. I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells 
we gather together tonight, we uh, always on Wednesday night spend a little bit more time in prayer. And uh, if you've ever been on a Wednesday night, we always invite people to share their prayer request. And, and very often from their pew, they will uh, lift up the name of someone who they've been thinking about, someone who needs a little extra care. And so we're not really able to do that right now in this format. Hopefully we'll be back to a uh, more normal schedule in the fall. But we do have some folks, and maybe you've got some folks at home that you would like to lift up in prayer, and uh, you can put that in the comment line. Um, I'm just trusting that you can hear me. Uh, I'm really flying a little blind here. Uh, we, we've had some, uh, we've had some uh, inconveniences and trials with the sound, but I, I'm hoping everything is good. So if you've got a prayer request, then go ahead and put it in the comment box, and, and we will be praying for it at church here. And uh, we will continue to be uh, engaging in the Lord. And they, others who are watching will also have that name and they can pray for. But I want to lift up a few people. Ben Gear is our uh, youth leader. And he's been working with our middle school and, and lower high school youth. He uh, sent me a message today that his mother-in-law was in a terrible accident and is in critical condition in the hospital. And so we want to lift up tonight Terry Chamberlain in our prayer and uh, also Ben and his wife and all the family as they watch and wait and we pray for healing. We pray for the doctors, the nurses that are working with Terry and we pray for uh, uh, healing and a recovery there. I got a little bit of good news this afternoon. Skip Terwilliger called me. He had talked with Michael Grillo and Esther is doing very well right now. The, the procedures that she had last week uh, seem to be effective and so they've stopped the internal bleeding and uh, she seems to be growing a little stronger and uh, Esther and Michael are in uh, uh, much better spirits but we want to continue to pray for them because Esther's battle continues as she battles the cancer and we pray that every day every day she'll feel the presence of the Lord and she'll know that you and I are praying for her and for Michael as well as he encourages her. I want to lift up Karen Siafi who had surgery and uh, it's coming along very well, uh, so we pray for her. We hope that she'll be able to be with us soon. I think I saw her name on the parking lot list, so hopefully she'll be with us on Sunday. I want to lift up Margaret Brown uh, in our continuing prayers. She's Katie Burnside's mom, and she's had a number of, of small strokes, and right now she is at the Gaylord Hospital in Wallingford, Connecticut. And so we pray for continued uh, rehabilitation and that she'll be back on her feet again. I want to lift up Don Plants, Aunt Jean, after her heart attack. I want to lift up uh, Marie Caradillo. I think I got it right this time. Uh, I want to lift up Marie. I was talking to Linda, um, Linda Bruno on Sunday, and Linda was just saying that she's really having a difficult time. She again, uh, I think she broke her arm and she broke her knee, and, and they had surgeries, and she's just having a hard time getting around. And so we pray for healing. We pray that God will take away the pain. And uh, when she's able to get back to do some rehabilitation, we pray that everything will go smoothly. So we lift up Marie tonight. Want to link, lift up in our continuing prayers, uh, Ben, a local high schooler who had that bad accident. Uh, we pray for his healing. Want to lift up Douglas McLean, um, Joanne Pacetti's brother. I have a friend of mine, Jack Spratt. A few weeks back, his brother, Denny, passed away. And so we, uh, we think of Jack and his mom in our continuing prayers. I want to think of John Maycumber as he's back at the Elms and we pray for continued and renewed health and strength. I want to think of uh, David Johnson, that's Paul's brother. Uh, he's still mourning the loss of his wife. Jennifer passed away a few weeks back and but David's got his own battle and he is now at home. His daughter is caring for him. Um, and so we think of David and we just ask a, a comfort and prayers uh, for all the family as well. I want to continue to lift up Mark Underwood, a friend and co-worker of Brian Gerbatovich's and his battle. I want to lift up Lou Ann Watson and uh, I want to lift up also um, Kathy DeMay and Evelyn Johnson and Jenny White in our continuing prayers. And, and again, maybe you've got some folks that you're thinking of too and we just lift them up uh, to the Lord tonight. I want to just uh, also just uh, take a, a moment uh, to reflect on the situation that's going on in the world all around us, um, especially the, the, the racial tensions and 
uh, one of the things that's been happening here in town, and we're very blessed in this community, um, is that the clergy, many of the clergy have come together and we're going to be praying and preaching on the sin of racism. Uh, you know, we all have some uh, little nuances in how we will deal with that, but we know that God created us, uh, male and female, in his image. We are part of God's family, and uh, there's no difference when it comes to the color of our skin or the nationality or where in the world we come from. We are all God's children. And when we start to uh, show our bigotry and our pro uh, uh, prejudice, uh, we are not following God's will. So we're going we're gonna to tackle that locally and try to do it in a way that will just help each other come together so that we can pray for all those who have faced injustice in their world. Um, also, I want to just continue to lift up the coronavirus and, and the victims. You know, some of us, we, we're kind of feeling, oh, good, we're getting past it. There's not that much activity here locally, and yet uh, every day when you turn on the news, you see that there are new outbreaks. And so we know that this is going to be with us for a while, but we would pray for healing. We would pray that God would end this coronavirus and that he would also continue to give us the wisdom and the patience, and I say that for myself, to be able to endure. Uh, again, many of the things that we're doing at church and in many of the places we're at have to do with caring for one another. Uh, so uh, we would pray that God would be working his way and bring healing in this world as we... Um, as we move forward in this coronavirus time. Um, so with those things in mind, I want us to continue and come to uh, a place of prayer. Again, I say this often on a Wednesday night that as we are talking to God, it is our prayer. Some people look at prayer as, oh, we've got to have our heads bowed and our hands in a certain position, uh, and we've got to close our eyes, and, and that's great, and that is a, a wonderful way to pray but the truth is prayer is really a conversation with God as we lay out those things in our heart many of the Psalms if you want to if you're not sure how to pray open up the Bible and and look at the Psalms and begin to kind of pray some of those those were David's prayers and I'm gonna uh, I, I mentioned one of those in my weekly epistle uh, Psalm 51 he created me a clean heart oh God and put a right spirit within me uh, that was David's prayer and so talking to God is prayer. And so you can continue to talk to God as uh, I provide a moment of quiet. And then I'll wrap up our prayer time. So let's continue in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come to you tonight. It has been a, a busy week filled with challenges for so many. Lord, we look to some of our big cities where after months of lockdown, the tensions are rising, anger and tempers are flaring. Oh Lord, we would pray for your peace and your justice and your righteousness to come upon those places those hot spots of anger and tension. Oh Lord, we pray for the families of those who have died. We pray for those who are business owners or renters or homeowners in these areas that have been affected by, by a few who have taken things to an extreme. But Lord, we know that we have challenges Lord, we, we face challenges in the church sometimes with people with differing opinions. And so when we live in this world that is, is influenced by secular things and by, by multicultural issues and, and by uh, backgrounds and upbringings that may differ and clash, Lord, it is not very difficult to see why we can disagree about so much. And yet, Lord, you remind us that we have one mother and one father in Adam and Eve, one heavenly father in you, and that we are all part of the same family, the human family. And Lord, there are more things that bring us together than tear us apart. Help us to see the best in the other. Help us to be uh, 
ambassadors for your good news and to share the hope of the gospel with the world around us. O oh Lord, to speak out against injustice and to be bearers of the truth. Lord, tonight as we gather together, we give praise and thanks for Esther and uh, for the good week that she's having, for the healing that is there. And we pray, Lord, you just lift her and Michael up and that they will know that you have been with them. And they will just be able to enjoy each single day they have. Oh, Lord, we ask you to be with, with uh, Karen and Margaret, with Marie, with Douglas, with Ben, with John, oh, Lord, and with David and each of them who have been in the hospital and, and have gone through some tremendous physical ordeals. And we pray for healing for each and every one of them. Lord, we ask you to be with Terry tonight, especially tonight in these critical hours since her accident. And we would pray, Lord, that you would lead and guide the doctors if they're doing surgeries. We pray, Lord, that you would be right there in the, in the operating room. That your hands would be guiding. That you would give the doctors, the nurses, those in the room what they need to see. And we pray, Lord, for healing. Be with, be with Terry's family tonight. Oh, Lord, as they, as they watch and wait and keep vigil. Oh, Lord, we ask you to be with our first responders, Lord. We think about the many police officers that we know who are good and decent peacekeepers. And Lord, we would pray that you would protect them and be with them as they seek to serve in a noble calling. And Lord, we would pray that you would be with the firefighters and the EMTs, that you would be with the nurses and the doctors in the hospitals, the physical therapists and all those working in the medical field, Lord. We know that they have been through a tremendous trial. Lord, we, we ask you to be with the teachers and with the students as the school year comes to an end, Lord. We, we thank you that you have given them what they need to get through. And we pray, Lord, that they'll have a time of renewal and refreshing in the weeks ahead. Well, Lord, we know it's so hard to be a child with just uh, uh, normal circumstances, but Lord, we know that these are even more challenging times. So Lord, be with our family. Lord, be with our community leaders as they seek to, to make plans for the well-being of our communities here in Westerly and, and Stonington and uh, Richmond and Ashaway and all over Charlestown. Lord, be with our leaders. Give them wisdom with the, the challenges that they face with budgets and, and all the circumstances of this day. Oh Lord, we pray for our church, our church here, Central Baptist. We pray for our older members, Lord. Be with them. We know that many of them have been isolated and are feeling lonely. Some of them are afraid, afraid to even venture out because of the virus, Lord. We ask you to, to be with them, surround them. Let the Holy Spirit help them to feel connected. Lord, we ask you to be with our families, with our couples, with our singles here at church. And Lord, Speak to them through the grace of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for our other sister churches in our community as well. As each pastor, each church leader tries to, to continue to keep the body together when we are apart. Oh Lord, give them wisdom with how to do that, even as we begin to come together in our individual houses of worship. Oh, Lord, hear our prayers now. These prayers and the others that have been lifted up and that are on our hearts as we come to you this night in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, I want to share with you tonight just a word from the book of Ephesians. Um, Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and uh, in this section of my Bible is called Unity and Maturity in the body of Christ. And so I'm going to read from chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. 
This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended into the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fulfill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of God. May God add a blessing as we hear his word tonight. My title is Birds of a Feather. Um, some of you may have heard that uh, it was an early birthday present. I got a bird feeder for my daughter, Rebecca. And, and I can't tell you how much joy that that has given me. I have it just off the deck, and uh, most mornings after I chase the squirrels away, um, I'm able to watch the birds just come to it, and they, they alight on, the, on the, the rail of the deck, and I always put a little food there for those who don't want to make the little hop. Uh, I'm doing a little projecting there, I think. Uh, and, and I watch the birds come. And one of the most amazing things that I noticed a couple of weeks ago was that there was one bird who would hop onto the feeder, get some food, and come back to this other one that was kind of just shaking the feathers there. Now, I wrongly, I'm going to get in trouble here, but I wrongly assumed that the one on the deck was the mother bird, and she was squawking at the father bird. But my, uh, my daughter, Sarah, the veterinarian, her, her boyfriend, Chris, knows all about birds. And when I shared that story, he said, no, that is the mother bird who is feeding the baby bird who has not yet quite learned how to use its feathers. And so that fluffing of the feathers is not, it's just a practice thing. And the mother comes, she's excited because the mother is coming to feed. You know, so I've been learning a little bit about birds. One night, I kind of actually went on Google and I looked up to see when do birds sleep and found all kinds of little things. But one of the things that we've learned about birds is that, well, you've heard the saying, birds of a feather flock together. And this saying is as old as, 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 as the Greek culture. Uh, I think there was a translation of one of uh, the the, the sentences in Plato's Republic that used this phrase first, birds of a feather flock together. And it suggests for us that people who are similar, who have similar interests, tend to stick together. Well, this morning I want to look at the church in this regard. Actually, tonight. I can't help it. Whenever I'm in church, it's morning. I said good morning to the people who came here tonight. Well, one of the saddest things that can happen in a church is when people begin to fight against each other instead of working together. And sadly, it happens too often in churches. Actually, I heard of a church in the late 1800s in this small town where there were two deacons, and they tended to be a little competitive and were always at odds over one thing or another. Well, these two deacons really didn't get along, and, uh, and there was one day when the preacher came in, the new preacher came in, and he took off his overcoat, and he didn't know where to put it. And so he put it on the back pew. Well, the next week, the next week, one of those deacons made the decision he put a peg on the back wall. And when the preacher came in, he came in and the deacon said, Here, pastor, there's a place for your coat. The other deacon was not happy. He was so upset that he had not been consulted about the peg that he left and he formed his own church. It's called the Anti-Peg Baptist Church. Now when the church is divided, it produces tragic results. On the other hand, when the church is unified, it unleashes a power that can hardly be stopped. In the book of Ephesians, Paul calls the church to unity. Paul mentions the unity of the church 18 times in this letter. Unity in the church isn't just extremely important. It is essential for the good of the gospel. And I think that is important today more than ever. When we talk about racism or poverty or injustice, people are looking for hope. 
And it's important that the church stands up and gives them that hope. You know, the greatest cause of unbelief in the world is not the theory of evolution. It's not scientific revelation. It's not secularism. The greatest cause of unbelief in the world is the poor testimony of many of us who profess to be followers of Christ. Far too often we proclaim unity, but we get divided over trivial issues. And as we battle over these things, the world looks on. Well, here's an amazing truth. The gospel brings hope and reconciliation. It has the power to restore broken lives. You look at what's going on in society around us, it is the church that is called to lead the way to bring healing and reconciliation in the world. Bertrand Russell, the great atheist philosopher, once said that if Christians practiced what they believed, they would change the world. And that's what the gospel says. We are to be transformers. Mahatma Gandhi said he loved our Christ, but he wasn't too sure about the Christians he knew. It's a sad statement. So in Ephesians, Paul gives us a crash course in practicing what we preach and then reminds us of seven things that unite us and should bring us together, no matter what the world throws at us to try to separate us. Paul begins with this idea of humility. It helps us see our lives as a gift from God. Any ability we have has been given to us by Him. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I like biographies. I have presidential biographies. And one of the biographies I have is on Walter Cronkite. And there's a cute story in this, in this autobiography. He tells that, that one day he and his wife were, selling, were, uh, were sailing down the Mystic River, not too far from here going through shallow water when a boat filled with young people sped past him. The young people were shouting and waving their arms and Cronkite waved back a cheery greeting. His wife asked him, do you know what they were shouting? And he replied, why, hello, Walter, it's Walter, it's Walter. And she said, no, they were shouting, low water, low water. You know, we all need a bit of humility once in a while. We always think it's all about us. That's why Paul stresses humility here. He goes on to suggest that we also need to nurture a gentle or meek spirit. And meekness is strength under control. The word used here is that of wild horses that are, are trained and broken so that they can be useful. Next, Paul lifts up the quality of patience. And patience means having a long fuse with other people. Even when they mess up, even when they put a peg in the back wall of your church. You probably heard the story, I, and I've got lots of stories tonight as I've been kind of looking through files. There's a story of these two men who were riding a tandem bicycle, and they got to a stretch where they were going up this long hill. And I'll tell you, the guy who was in front, he's just going and going and going. And when they get to the top, he says, you know, he says, that is the hardest I've ever had to pedal. It seems like everything was against me. And he said, well, it was a good thing I had my foot on the brake all the way up. I was afraid we were going to roll backwards. You know, there are people probably in your life, I know in my life I've had people <laughs> who seem to be always dragging us down and irritating us. Sometimes we have people who disappoint us. They'll do things maybe even that hurt us. That's why at the end of verse 2, speaking about life in the church, we're told to bear with one another in love. Literally, this means to suffer with one another. By God's grace, we'll stick together through thick and thin like birds of a feather. This is the for better or worse part of the marriage applied to the church. And notice that we're to bear each other in love. Not with sarcasm, but with love. Not begrudgingly, but with love. And we're reminded of this again in, Corinthians, in Colossians 3, where Paul says, Over all virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. You see, the only thing that can hold us together as a church, as a people, as a nation, is if we learn to love one another. Love is the bedrock. It is a foundation for us as followers of Christ. For God so loved the world, that's you and me, 
with all our warts, he called us to do the same to the people around us, the people in the church. But then he said, love your enemies. And when he was talking about enemies, he was talking about people who think differently than you. Maybe even people who have hurt you or persecuted you. On the cross, he said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Paul, in another place, calls us to have the same spirit in us that he had in him. And it's hard. In verse 3, he tells us to make every effort to be diligent and committed to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to notice that our responsibility is not to create the unity, but to keep the unity. You see, God already has it in the Trinity, and he passes it on to us. That when he calls us into his family, he calls us to be one to have that unity that he has among the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Recently, some of our church, uh, churches celebrated Trinity Sunday. And we're reminded that the Godhead is three in one and we are to be that way in community. In verses four to six, Paul reminds us of seven gifts that serve as the focus of our Christian unity. And we'll go through these quickly because I know our time is running out. These are the things that he cites as the commonalities that bring us together. The first is this, that the followers of Christ are part of one body. Like our human bodies, which is made up of thousands of cells, it is still only one life. This is my hand. My hand can be doing stuff over here. Lori always tells me that I'm fidgeting and doing things. My knees sometimes shake. It's all part of the one body. She said control it. The body of Christ has infinite numbers of expressions shaped by culture, personality, by historical context, and many things. But the one constant is that this body shares the life of Christ, Christ in us. Second, Paul reminds us that there's only one spirit. The same Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. That's why sometimes you can go somewhere, and I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you'll be somewhere and you just look at someone and you know that there's something you have in common. That's because the Spirit of Christ is shining through them. That Holy Spirit, same Spirit that is in all believers is in you and me. Third, Paul says there is one hope. You know, when you listen to the news or read the papers today, there's lots of fleeting hopes lifted up, but I believe this, that hope rests solely in Jesus Christ. That's why I say the church has an important job to do in these days. We have the hope of eternal life and salvation in Jesus. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is our hope, and he shows us how to share hope. It is the mission of the church to share Christ, his, his values, his hope, his, his, his love, his grace, his confession, and forgiveness. Fourth, Paul says we worship one Lord, and we serve only one Lord, Jesus Christ. I could get myself in real trouble, but we're out of time. So I'm just going to say this. The word for Lord used here is kurios. Jesus is the one and only supreme ruler of the universe. If there is one that we should bow down to, there is one that we should worship, it is only Jesus. Unfortunately, the world throws a lot of things at us, calls us to worship them, but the only thing we're called to worship is Jesus. Fifth, Paul adds that we have one faith, one common faith. The basis of our faith is shared with every other Christian church. It rests squarely on Jesus the Christ. There's no middle ground, either your faith is in Jesus, or it's not. There are no kindas or sortas available. Well, I kind of believe in Jesus. I kind of like some of the things he says. You know, Thomas Jefferson, the president, had his own Bible. He took the Bible and he didn't like the miracle story, so he cut him out. And you can see it down in Washington, D.C., in the Smithsonian. He kind of liked Jesus, but not all the things. There's no way. Jesus said, if you're not for me, then you're against me. The sixth thing that unites followers of Christ is our baptism. This is a signal to the world that we belong to the family of God. And I'm going to be preaching this on Sunday. I know that we use different methods in the different various traditions of church. 
but it's still the one symbol that we belong to Jesus. It tells the world, it declares to the world that we belong to Christ. And finally, there's only one God and Father. Once we accept Christ into our lives, we become part of his forever family. You know, our dog Praise, who died a few years ago, was a, a rescue dog. And um, he must have been abused because when he first came to us, every time you would lift your voice, he would, he would shudder. Um, and uh, if he could get out the door, he'd run away. And we tried to tell him, we love him, we love him, we love him. And yet he would run every chance he got. He was so afraid. And uh, I, remember, I remember talking to the vet we had at the time. And he used this phrase, which is often used in adoptions. He said, things will change when praise realizes that he's part of a forever family. And he will come to love you, even as you are now trying to love him. And you see... That's what God has done to us. He has reached out and claimed us to be a part of his forever family. And, uh, and, and that is the great hope and the message of the gospel for all those who have been abused, who have been hurt, who have been uh, victims of injustice, to know that they have someone who loves them. You know, a few years ago at the Special Olympics, there were nine physically or mentally challenged runners who lined up at the starting line for the 100-meter run. And at the sound of the gun, all of them eagerly started out. Except for one boy, all of a sudden you heard him cry. He slipped coming out of the gate and fell down. You probably heard this story or one like it. Uh, most of us, like me, I'm very competitive, and I probably would have just kept running and said, one less that I have to be. But these children, one girl saw her friend had fallen, she went back down and she leaned over and she kissed him on the head. The other boys and girls began to see, turned around, look what was happening, and they all came back. And they all then helped pick him up and then they linked arms and they ran the rest of the race together. And the cheering of the crowd who saw that went on for over 10 minutes as they went around the track. You see, that race paints a picture of what God is calling the world to be, but more particularly what he's calling us to be as the family of God. We're all wounded, we're all challenged in one way or another, but God in his infinite mercy and grace makes us part of his forever family through our faith in Jesus. And it's with our spiritual family that we journey through life, helping each other along the way. And so in these difficult times, I encourage you, when you see someone who's hurting, when you see someone who's stumbled, when you see someone who's crippled by, by whatever it is in their life, reach out and help lift them up in the name of Jesus. And you'll be doing the work of the ministry of the church of Jesus Christ. Well, God bless you tonight. I want to say that uh, it's been nice having you here. And, uh, and when we get into July, uh, we're hoping we can invite some more of you to come and join us on Wednesday nights for our service as well as Sunday mornings. But uh, God bless you and hope to see some of you on Sunday morning, either in the sanctuary or in the parking lot. Again, call up and make sure to make a reservation here at church. God bless you. Good night.